Welcome back, everybody, to What Really Matters. I'm Tablet Deputy Editor Jeremy Stern with you in Los Angeles. I'm here, as always, with Walter Russell Mead, Tablet News Writer, Global View Columnist at The Wall Street Journal, and Distinguished Fellow at Hudson. Let's start with this week's news. First story of the week. When Americans are asked to check a box indicating their religious affiliation, 28% now check none. A new study from Pew Research finds that the religiously unaffiliated, a group comprised of atheists, agnostics, and those who say their religion is, quote, nothing in particular, is now the largest cohort in America. They're more prevalent among American adults than Catholics at 23% or evangelical Protestants at 24%. Back in 2007, the, quote, nuns, N-O-N-E, made up just 16% of Americans, but Pew's new survey shows that number has now risen dramatically. Walter, is this news or phone news? Uh, it's tangled. And, you know, headline is certainly news. But I think uh, my own understanding of, of what's going on here is a lot of it is the um, progressive weakening of forms of religious identification that were always driven more by culture than conviction. So, you know, if we if we look, just say it at um, groups like the Irish, the Italians, the Jews, sort of immigrant groups who come from a culture that has predominantly a single religion. And then they come to the United States. Often, by the way, the immigrants who came to the United States were less religious than the the fellow members of their groups who stayed home. I remember reading that in the 19th century, Jewish rabbis encouraged religious young people to stay home. Don't go to the United States because there's no rabbis over there. There's no good kosher. You can't really get a good Jewish education for your kids. Stay home. Uh, and and actually, there were other groups that that were giving that kind of message. However, once these groups got here, they found themselves, you know, if anything, more conscious of being Irish or Italian or Jewish or what, because they were feeling this kind of, you know, discrimination and feeling a sense of being, uh, what is it that those wonderful academics say, being othered by the general population. And that drove people together. Uh, And you would also, you'd find these cases of these sort of poor Irish immigrants uh, who are pinching their pennies to build these very impressive stone churches that we still see in many American cities. And as they got a little bit more established, they want to make sure that St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York or St. Matthew's Cathedral in Boston was was more impressive than the Protestant uh, temples of the of the face that they they felt discriminated against by. And in the same way, by the way, the move among American Catholics to develop this huge network of parochial schools, because they felt that these the uh, public schools, while claiming to be non-denominational, so were actually just Protestant. And so if you wanted your kids to have a Catholic education, you'd have to provide it yourself. So you had a tremendous sense of belonging to these groups. Uh, and... Uh, it was would go if you were Irish, you would normally just say I was Catholic, even if you only darkened the door of the church, sort of baptism, wedding, and your own funeral. You know, you uh, and you'd be carried on the books, by the way, as a Catholic, because unless you sort of go and say, take my name off your records, you're in there. Uh, so over the last 30 uh, over the last 50 years really we've seen a tremendous weakening of these kinds of ethnic identities in many cases even some of the strongest ones you look at the percentages of young american jews who marry outside the the faith of the community let's say now it's enormous I was at a uh, dinner not long ago where one of the speakers made the joke, uh, what's the difference between Donald Trump and a liberal Jewish billionaire? The answer is Donald Trump has Jewish grandchildren. So so you have um, that weakening of communal identity. And I think it's sort of gone to the point in the last generation or so where the this, you know, first of all, a lot of the people would say, you know, what ethnic group are you? Well, you know, my 
I have a Polish grandmother, an Irish grandfather, an Italian grandmother on the other side, and a French grandfather on the other side. I'm none. I'm none. Um, I don't have a strong ethnic identity. And to the extent that religious identity was less about I've had an internal experience that has changed my heart and and given me a deep inner conviction of the truth of the Christian religion, something which I suspect was a minority uh, conviction all the time. Uh, then I think um, we're seeing we're we're seeing sort of like you know why pretend? What does it matter? There's kind of a critical mass of secularization. So I think some of what we're seeing is more a revealed preference. Than a, than a deep change of heart. That doesn't mean that this isn't change in the culture, however. Uh, you know, a culture where one needed to sort of say one, you know, just would say, oh, of course I'm religious, you know, I'm Presbyterian, because in your town, you know, you didn't want to say, you know, even even saying you were Unitarian was a little daring. Um, now, you know, th it, it's comfortable, it's normal, um, in in many communities, in many places, not all, to, to do this. So, uh, does it matter? You know, that's the next question. I, I think it does. And what matters, in a sense, is maybe less that it, ma it matters in the eyes of eternity, perhaps, that fewer Americans are, are believing in religious truths. But it matters in the culture in that fewer Americans are having a religious education or a religious grounding. So uh, the kids who are nuns maybe have also not been going to parochial school, or if they did, um, you know, had a sort of he less heavy. We've seen also, by the way, one or two generations ago, a massive collapse in the number, just to talk about Catholics, of people in religious orders. The nuns and priests who actually used to do the bulk of the staffing of these parochial schools. So these networks are less intentionally or visibly Catholic, just as Notre Dame is, well, Notre Dame is perhaps more Catholic. Let's, let's take Georgetown in Washington is, you know, it's a, it's a Catholic university, but it's not always clear to every undergrad what that is or what it means, or even that they think about it ever. So there's a distancing from these things, from, from moral lessons, from there's a all forms of of uh most almost every form of religion carries in it a deep respect for human beings and for the equality of human beings and it brings a deep sense of ethical obligation moral obligation was somebody once said conscience is is the thing that keeps you from stealing even when nobody is looking uh, and I think uh, we are seeing a bit of a fraying of that in American society. And I don't think the consequences are going to be very good. Maybe also, when people have had less of a religious education or, or, or grounding, they are far more vulnerable to various kinds of uh, fakes, frauds. And this can be a civil religion, a, a, a political cult of some kind. We have plenty of those on the left and the right. We see things like uh, astrology coming back and crazy superstitions and, uh, you know, sort of silly thing. You know, when, when, when the light of faith goes out, um, you don't necessarily see clear reason and, and uh, you know, a sort of the end of superstition. You actually see more ghosts in the dark, maybe, than you did in the light. So I think it's a it's a bad sign, but one has to to take it thoughtfully and carefully. All right, our second story. Secretary of State Antony Blinken asked the State Department to conduct a review and present policy options on possible U.S. and international recognition of a Palestinian state after the war in Gaza. According to Axios, the Biden administration is linking possible normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia to the creation of a pathway for the establishment of a Palestinian state as part of its post-war strategy. Some inside the Biden administration are now thinking recognition of a Palestinian state should possibly be the first step in negotiations to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict instead of the last. 
This news came one day after British Foreign Secretary David Cameron said the UK is, quote, ready to bring forward the moment when it formally recognizes a Palestinian state, close quote. Walter, is this news or faux news? Again, it's one of these things where you have to you have to look past the surface um, because it's, in a way, what, what you're, we're hearing from the State Department is very cleverly um, set up. There are going to be people in the State Department are going, yes, he's finally going to do it. We're going to get a Palestinian state. It's possible that they'll do that, but it's possible also that this is a way to kind of quiet critics, uh, that the people who are leading this are sort of aware this is actually not as easy as you might think it would be. In any case, any Palestinian state they're going to recognize if they decided to recognize, and many countries have recognized, say the Palestinian Authority as as the state of Palestine. The state doesn't have an army; it doesn't control its own borders, uh, doesn't control its own territory, it doesn't control its own finances. It doesn't, you know, Israel hands back money uh, from Palestinian utility payments and so on. So, one of the thing, one of the criticisms that people make of peace proposals that come out of Jerusalem these days is that you're going to trim away the meaning of Palestinian sovereignty to the point where you're just sort of pretending that it's a state rather than recognizing its statehood. Well, you could read this proposal as exactly that. Uh, We're going to give you, we're going to sort of all go through a little pantomime. Ah, your state. Isn't that lovely? Congratulations. You know, is that going to satisfy serious Palestinian national aspirations? No, it isn't. Is it going to satisfy Hamas? No, Hamas doesn't want a Palestinian state. Hamas opposes a Palestinian state, except possibly as a temporary stage toward the reestablishment of his Islamic Ummah. So... What is it that that Secretary Blinken is saying that the State Department should study? It's studying everything, presumably from, t- you know, telling the Israelis to get out of the West Bank, get out of Gaza, let the Palestinians develop their own, and blah 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 blah. Uh, you know, so that kind, and get the, get the settlements out too, or to this kind of like uh, well maybe if we put a nice little fake um label on the map the saudis will find that that's just enough to allow them to so you so in this initiative you can have a very pro israel initiative unfolding or you can have a very anti israel unfolding and it gives people in the Democratic Party, and don't forget there's an election coming up in November, everybody can kind of read this in their own way. And when the administration wants to make the left happy, it can say something about, you know, as we study this, we're really seeing the need for blah, 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 blah. Or if it feels like, oh, we're losing some votes on the center, we need to do something over there and say, well, you know, as we look at this, we realize that, in fact, blah, blah, blah. So far, what this is, is a very masterful piece of fake news. And it's not, but it's not fake news. The administration has figured that out. Uh, Machiavelli would approve. I suspect Henry Kissinger might approve. Um, but but the rest of us really don't have any clue what they mean. And my guess is they haven't figured that out either. It'll depend, as I think it was Harold Macmillan once said, it'll depend on events, my dear boy, events. All right, final story of the week. How should we make sense of reports that Gen Z is hyper-progressive on certain issues, but surprisingly conservative on others? The answer According to Alice Evans, a visiting fellow at Stanford and one of the leading researchers on the topic, is that today's under 30s are undergoing a great gender divergence, with young women becoming much more progressive and young men going in the opposite direction. Gen Z is two generations, not one, as the Financial Times summarized the research. In countries on every continent, an ideological gap has opened up between young men and women, and it's widening. In the U.S. in particular, after decades in which the sexes were each spread roughly equally across liberal and conservative worldviews, women aged 18 to 30 are now 30 percentage points more liberal than their male contemporaries. 
That gap took just six years to open up, and similar results have been found in Germany, South Korea, the UK, and elsewhere. As a result, tens of millions of people who occupy the same cities, workplaces, classrooms, and even homes no longer see eye to eye. Walter, is this news or faux news? Well, certainly in every preceding generation in the history of the world, men and women have agreed on everything. And the constant harmony and unanimous agreement between the sexes on all forms of social, political, and economic thinking is, I think, something that all of us just take for granted. So this is tremendously shocking that that young people actually show some kind of differences in their thinking. And, you know, easy come, easy go, too. Oh, this has opened up in the next six years. Perhaps it will close down in the next six years. I mean, it's a... Uh, you know, one of the problems with studying public opinion is like studying water. It moves all the time. And young people, by the way, tend to be more uh, quicker to change their views than older people uh, because they're still forming their views and still encountering experiences that make them think. Then on top of that, as I understand it, some other people have gone and looked at the data and said, well, this is actually somewhat exaggerated. It's uh, the differences are not as wide as you think and so on and so forth. I think there probably are some polarizing issues like, for example, um, abortion. But again, there historically, women have been more conservative than men, more pro-life than men. So, you know, what is that? I do think if we listen to young men in this country, uh, we hear a kind of a, for many of them, a sort of a silent protest against what they see. You know, they see feminism being aligned with various other sort of woke ideologies that kind of end up with one group of people at the bottom of the social pecking order, white men. And since many of us older white men have already managed to carve out a, a nice spot in the world, uh, the, the younger ones who are being denied an opportunity, as many of them may see it, to try to climb the ladder when they're suffering active discrimination. I mean, the thing I would hate to be most would be a young white PhD in the social sciences looking for a university job at a liberal arts college. It's going to be really, really hard to get. And I'm sure none of this would have to do with any sort of discrimination or quota. <laughs> that would be wrong. Uh, and so this, I, I remember once I was at, a, at an academic conference and uh, a, a woman who was an administrator at another university was talking about, uh, you know, supporting groups and their identities. And I said, well, suppose you had a group of, suppose we talk about a community college or very non-elite state college in the Ohio or Kentucky coal fields. And you have a bunch of young white men who uh, are your students and, you know, they their fathers have not made a lot of money and they're not, you know, their father traded in their white privilege for a job in a coal mine uh, and it's probably not a great trade. But, you know, they want to get together and talk about great white men of the past and say, well, you know, many of the founding fathers of the American Revolution were white males Many of the great inventors in the past have been white males. Many great scientists, many military heroes have been white males. And so to gather some inspiration from this heritage and great examples that would inspire them to do more, she said, we would not allow it. You know, it would it would obviously, oh my God, the Klan is here. The Klan is here. This is the most terrible thing in the world. Well, when you do that, you are basically encouraging, you know, you're encouraging these young men to turn to the only people who would listen to them under those circumstances, and they tend to go to Trump rallies. Uh, we have not really thought through, I think, as a society, you know, exactly how we're going to strike all these balances, um, and that some young men have become much more conservative on a range of social and economic issues because they sense that the progressive universe has identified them as the enemy. I think that's a factor. But, um, but you know, sort of how deep does it run and uh, how long will it last and what countervailing pressures there are at work? I think many of us believe that we may have kind of passed sort of peak woke in society that – 
Um, there's a bit of a sense, you know, the Harvard Board of Overseers is thinking maybe we went a little bit too far. Um, uh, there's some others. Uh, you're 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 seeing a little bit more openness to some criticism of of ideas that were unquestionable on many campuses a couple of years ago. So maybe if we begin to kind of the pendulum moves back toward a more center position. Some of this polarization may start to ebb. Who knows? Who knows? We're in, we're in new territory here. But I'm not yet ready to say that Gen Z will be the first generation in which men and women stop speaking to each other. All right. That does it for this week's news, but it's a good segue into the big conversation. So last week, Walter, we talked about the potential constitutional crisis between Texas and the federal government over border policy. In past episodes, we've talked about surveys showing the worrying number of Americans who at least say they're unprepared to accept the results of the 2024 election as legitimate if the party they favor doesn't win. I remember also one survey we talked about that showed something like over a third of Americans uh, say they consider political violence to be a legitimate means of achieving policy aims. And then this week we talked about widening ideological gaps among Americans, perhaps on gender or religious or other lines. There's, of course, the many attempts to disqualify or imprison the likely GOP presidential nominee. So there's been a lot of what I'd call loose and irresponsible, though at this point not entirely irrelevant talk about potential civil conflict in America. I really hesitate to repeat the term civil war, although that is the term you hear and read a lot of people using these days. So I thought it would be a good opportunity to review a bit of history this week in the U.S. and maybe elsewhere too, and ask you, what are the structural conditions that have led let's say, even advanced democracies into real traumatic civil conflict? Is it simply the emergence of these kinds of grievances and cleavages we're talking about? Is it that that combined with a lack of state capacity to put down potential political violence? Is it weakness or dissatisfaction among elites? Is it easy access to guns? I mean, what, what can you tell us here? The first thing I say is none of the above, because there's not actually a lot of record of real civil wars breaking out in advanced industrial democracies. The you know, English haven't had a civil war since the 17th century. And, and of all the things you can say about Stuart England, uh, advanced industrial democracy is not really it. Um, our civil war in the 1860s was in a very different country uh, with a very different economy and a very different society than we have now. And I look around uh, Europe, I don't see in you know Western Europe, no real civil wars. You sometimes have, you, we've had coups. There was a coup in Greece in 67, I guess. We've had, but even in Spain when Franco died, you know, the civil war before Franco that Franco came in on, but, um, the Spain at the end of uh, Franco era transitioned peacefully. And while there have been real ethnic tensions in, uh, in the Catalonian region and in the Basque region, including some, some violence, it's never gotten to the level of civil war. I think in, in some ways the, the balance has to be against somebody who's, who's predicting inevitable civil war or something like that. It just, um, we're, you know, the, a lot has to go wrong before civil war could break out. And I'll look at, you know, when I look at, say, slavery, and, you know, I'm from South Carolina, and so I grew up with a lot of people who said slavery had nothing to do with the war. But then you go back and you look at some of the founding documents of the Confederacy, and you'll find that actually their ancestors said pretty clearly, we're doing this because they're trying to make us stop owning slaves. Um, I mean, there were other, the other issues too, and I think by the end of the war, it had become a real war of identity as well. But in any case, um, slavery was, was a fundamental element in the order of whatever society you were in. So if you were in a slave society in the, in the American South, m the most valuable, you know, I hate talking this way because we're talking about people like property, but that's, you know, the essence of what was going on here. So, the 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 south's wealth was in the form of these enslaved people 
And so you can look at census tracts in 1860, where you had the highest per capita wealth in the country that were desperately poor, like in Mississippi in 1870, and have remained among the poorest places in the country all these years later, because, you know, this sort of economic foundation of that society was destroyed in the Civil War. Thank God, I say, but nevertheless, it was destroyed. And so we're talking, we're talking about a way of not just a way of life, like, oh, I feel so sentimental about it and stuff. We're talking about like, you know, how is the debt on a mortgage repaid? Where does the money come from? And what's the foundation of our law and our custom? And also the very big question of like, well, if you don't free, if you free them, what happens then? Because in some Southern states, the blacks were actually the slaves, were the majority of the population. So we're talking the most fundamental political questions. And then on the Northern side, um, this notion of slave labor and competition with free labor and the sort of moral and political intellectual assault on, on the foundations of American life was just deeply different. And connected with these different societies, and since you had common sense was different, because in the South people would say, "Well, you know, slavery might not be might not be great if you just consider in the abstract, but it's kind of common sense that you know we need to control this black majority in our state, or it's common sense that you can't have a wealthy Southern society without this social." thing and you could look at history blah 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 they would go on and on and on about it but it it spoke to this was tied up in their idea of how things could work and a change a con you know if the south wanted to try to expand slavery into the north it would fundamentally change the way the north worked and if slavery were to be abolished it would totally change the way the south worked and both sides sensed by 1860 that it was going to ultimately go one way or the other. There is nothing in American society like that today. There are places where kind of blue city or blue state common sense seems very different from red city or red state common sense. So, for example, gun control. Uh, people who live in places like New York, Chicago, uh, you have heavy policing, and there are a lot of people who feel that, like, I would be safer if I didn't own a gun, but also nobody else did. Um, that's the way to make me safe. And then you have people, you know, in a farming community in on the Great Plains and say, well, you know, I trust myself and I trust all my neighbors, but we are 50 miles from a, the nearest police station. And if I don't have a gun out here, uh, all kinds of things could could happen. So and and so in, it's common sense to me that my having a gun keeps me and my family safe, while it's common sense to somebody else in a Maryland suburb that the fewer guns there are, the better. And why can't those red state gorillas see this obvious stinking truth? And that makes people angry when my common sense clashes with your common sense. We don't understand it. And it's hard to resolve that in democracy, but it's not the same level of kind of foundational existential thing. Ditto things like abortion, where again, as we've seen, though, in some red states, they've done referendums and, you know, sort of made sure that their state legislatures won't be able to abolish abortion. There is a sense in which I think the country, you know, there's a compromise there that some people at both ends would hate, but that would more or less kind of work for most people. There wasn't an answer like that for slavery, particularly. And there are other, there are other things like in, uh, if you live in New York City, the idea that the federal minimum wage was see, seven seventy five an hour, whatever it is now, is insane. You would starve to death. You couldn't even afford to be homeless in New York uh, on that kind of wage. But, you know, there are other parts of the country where costs are lower that, well, it's not a great wage, but it's not a living death. And on the other hand, if you're telling me the minimum wage should be $20 an hour, $15, or whatever, that's insane. Nobody could pay that, you know, blah, blah, blah. And every business in town would go, would go bankrupt, et cetera. So 
there are these red state, blue state issues where the people in one part of the country just deeply feel that something is right, proper, and sensible, and people in another part of the country think something quite different is right, proper, and sensible. Okay, uh, fine. That's called politics. It's called normal. It's called what a continental republic is going to have. I don't see these things getting us to anything like a civil war. Economic questions, you know, maybe could could have something, but it's not at the moment like we have, you know, that we have a socialist international rising up. I mean, we've got Antifa, we've got, you know, but right now, the more people sort of look at Portland, Oregon, the less it looks like a viable model for the rest of the of the country. Um, you know, we're certainly not looking at Franco Spain, where you have a very militant left getting, which is very well organized, getting ready to fight a very militant right. Yeah, you know, we're 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 not there. People talk about a theocracy as a danger. The problem is in America, you could. Even if all the Christians in America decide, okay, we're going to have a theocracy, was well, that going to be a Catholic theocracy <laughs> or is it going to be a Protestant theocracy? And if it is a Protestant theocracy, uh, is it going to be like, is it going to be an infant baptism theocracy? Is it going to be a predestination theocracy? Uh, what happens is, you know, there isn't a religious consensus in America that is strong enough, you know, to, to impose any kind of a coherent program on the rest of society. So I, I think we've got a lot of um, factors in our society militating. Now, does that, does that mean that you can't have riots? You certainly can have riots. Uh, you can have very destructive things, very bad things can happen. Uh, we could become a significant. We had we had, I think, more political violence in the '60s and '70s than we do today, and we could go back to that. Anything from green activists deciding, you know, I got to blow up that power plant or in order to save the planet, to um, anti-government. You know, the only way I can stop the great conspiracy, Epstein didn't kill himself. We got to blow up whatever irs or whatever it may be yeah things like that can happen terror can happen but i think as a country we're actually you might say we're too disorganized to have a civil war all right that does it for the big conversation let's end on the tip of the week Another reader request this week, Walter, this time from Jen in Simi Valley, California, who wants to know, quote, who was your childhood hero and who is your hero now? I guess I'd have to say my child. When I was a kid, really, my dad was my hero. You know, he was uh, a priest in the Episcopal Church. So every Sunday I would see him up there leading the congregation Um you know, in public worship and everybody would always be saying to me, your father's a really good man. And, you know, he knew Martin Luther King marched with him. So, you know, I, I thought, wow, that's just really terrific. What a great dad I've got. And beyond him, I'd say it was my grandfather, my, my father's father, who was a doctor in a small town in South Carolina, a uh, Yale grad who got a very scientific medical um education time that was not universal, came down to a very backward part of the country and devoted the rest of his life to taking care of people, many of whom didn't have any money. I remember one story about him was that he, um, his partner, his medical partner was drafted in World War II. My grandfather by then was too old for that. So my grandfather, during all the years of the war, treated all his partner's patients and at the when he returned, when the partner returned from the war, my grandfather gave him a check for every penny that those patients had paid him during the entire period of the war. And that was that was the kind of man he was. Wow. So both of those men, you know, were people that I looked up to and hoped someday maybe I could grow to be like them. Now it turns out as I've grown older, I look more and more like them. But I'm not quite sure that on the inside, I've uh, managed to achieve what they did. 
All right, there you have it. Thanks to our producer, Noam Bloom. Thanks to Will Cummings at Hudson and my co-host, Walter Russell Mead. I'm Jeremy Stern. We'll see you next week. And until then, please consider rating the podcast and leaving a review.